The Mental Health Cafe is a rather unique opportunity for the workplace to hold very um, specialized, short, let's call it uh, meetings, where leadership and employees, <clears throat> excuse me, of different levels can get together and discuss mental health concerns, mental health issues, and in this case, mental health research. And what I can tell you from experience is that this last year, as Brenda has mentioned, as we all have lived and experienced, you know, we, we've kind of been pushed to our limits regarding our mental health, our ability to reach out and help others, and, and just essentially our overall mental wellness function. And this cafe is designed to bring to you the latest research on mental health in the workplace, uh, specifically related to COVID, and um, what we can do about it. And we're going to end with a few coping strategies. So please, if you have questions, just ask away, as Brenda mentioned, uh, use the chat and just keep them in. And I, I hope you enjoy. So get ready, let's do our cafe. And the title? Shelly, Shelly, yes. the sound is not really good. Can you lean in, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Is this better? Not really. Oh, I haven't changed anything. How's this? Are we getting any better? No. I don't understand this. It's I like a someone is calling it like a robotic sound as if it's a feedback and someone else says there's a vibration in the sound. Really? All right. Um, gee, this has not changed anything. I wonder, is everybody muted? I think everybody's muted. Um, Would you like me to try headphones and see if that makes a difference? I think headphones would be a good idea, Shelley. How is this? Sounds much better. This is a lot better? Yes. All right, and my apologies, everybody. Okay, well, let's start our mental health cafe and the theme, let's go for the green. Are we ready for this? Because as we've all understood and we've all experienced the last year, 2020, 2021, it's, it certainly has been quite a ride. And I think the only thing that could possibly symbolize what we've experienced is to look at this massive roller coaster. I mean, look at the ups and downs. We've experienced all that. I mean, really and truly, what have, what have we gone through? Well, first and foremost, back in 2015, or why am I saying 2015? I apologize. Back in March, March 15th, we were locked down. You know, the pandemic hit, everybody was told, go home. So we did. We worked from home. Some of us successfully, some of us not so successfully. We all had challenges associated with it. And now, well, let's say now we're looking at perhaps a really good positive perspective. We, you know, given everything that we've experienced, everything we've endured, everything that we've gone through, our hopes, you know, our needs, our desires, what we've been after in terms of workplace satisfaction, personal satisfaction, et cetera, we've, we've experienced a lot. So it's absolutely, absolutely time to look up and say, you know what? Our government had, says, had said it's time for green, but we're going to look at it and say it's blue skies ahead for all of us because you know what? Once you encounter that open blue sky, you can start writing whatever it is you want on it. That's your notebook. You can do it. So what does blue sky ahead mean for us? 
vaccines. Absolutely. And let's, let's be real. Vaccines, you know, has created quite a controversy because not everybody has the same perspective on the value of a vaccine. So we have to be respectful of everybody's opinion, of everybody's perspective, because people have different experiences associated with vaccines. We know by and large that the majority of the population has embraced vaccines. We know that they work, but we also know that not everybody shares that same sense. And it's our job to just simply respect somebody else's perspective and hopefully to continue the education as to the value of vaccines. And we're starting our return to workplace activities. Today, children return to school. It's going to look far different for them, but you know what? They're excited. They get to see their friends. They get to sit in a classroom. They get to experience that support. They get to experience just simply getting out of their home. And for many, it's a positive, positive situation. Now, let's not forget there, again, there always will be that little group of individuals, little groups of children and their parents who have that little bit of trepidation associated with their children being in a classroom. You know, we have to address these fears openly because they exist. But hopefully, hopefully, what will take place is the understanding that still practicing the public safety guidelines will enable our children, ourselves and everybody, to continue enjoying an overall healthy return to the workplace and to the classroom. We have lessening of public health protocols. We understand that people need to start getting back into what they've referred to as a sense of normalcy, whatever that actually is defined as being. We know that businesses, they have to succeed. They have to flourish. They're only going to flourish if people are starting to get out and get involved with those business activities. However, we have to ask ourselves, what, what does this really mean? Like, are we safe? Are we going to be able to continue doing this? Well, how we choose what we're going to do depends on our experiences. Because we have to understand this past year, it certainly has changed us. It's changed the way we look at things, the way we look at ourselves. Some of us have embraced it and become perhaps a little more relaxed, a little bit more in tune with our inner child, our inner self, as the, the picture of uh, myself fooling around with my husband on screen definitely shows. And you know, for some, it, it has caused more stress. One group will say, you know what? Overall, that lockdown was the best thing that ever happened because it enabled more time to be spent with my family, those who were fortunate to be with their family. It enabled us to learn more about ourselves, about each other. It was a good thing. Who would have thought? And then again, we have those who just simply said, you know what? I was locked down, but locked down alone. And we have to recognize that for some individuals, it was a very frightening perspective. It was a situation where it was not as positive. And for a lot of individuals, they even made mention of the fact that it, it just simply was not a good experience for them. They, they were able to do a lot of introspective thinking and, and for some individuals, they didn't really like what they saw. However, we can, you know, we can just simply start turning that around. We can start looking at it from a different perspective because what we need to know is what the research has found. And over the past year, over the past 15 months, the Canadian Psychological Association, as well as the American Psychological Association has been extremely busy doing a lot of research because unfortunately for situations like this, it does provide great opportunity for us to get to know deep inside what goes on for individuals who are experiencing situations like this. So let's see what the research has found. Long-term effects, unfortunately, we do know that COVID-19 does affect mental health. It does affect the way we think. It does affect our physical brain. Individuals who have experienced 
the virus, have also experienced debilitating long-term effects afterwards. Of course, that depends on the severity of um, their infection with the virus, because not everybody did experience negative outcomes. Some individuals, they simply admitted that it was like they had a really, really, really bad flu, and they were able to recover. They were quite resilient. Their immune system functioned the way it needed to. But for others, unfortunately, the outcome was a bit more catastrophic. It was not as positive. And again, because we're all unique, because our bodies all respond uniquely to various situations, events, viruses, everybody responded differently. So let's explore what actually did come out of all the research. Well, what we know now and what maybe you have experienced as well, I know I certainly can raise my hand with this statistic, two out of three Americans, they reported sleep disruptions. There were issues with how individuals were sleeping. Some people, they just simply slept too much. Others had a shortened sleep pattern. They were sleeping less. And others just simply experienced insomnia. And I will openly admit, I'll raise my hand for this one. I would go to bed and lie awake. Two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock still wondering when was that magical time that I would fall asleep, knowing that in a very short time, I would be getting up again for the next day, or for that day, I guess, at that point. So we have to recognize these are real. We also have to recognize that there was COVID sleep loss, not just disruption in sleep, such as too much, too little, or insomnia, but actual sleep loss associated with the actual virus. For example, people had difficulty breathing. People experienced intense fatigue. And those who were fortunate to fall asleep did not experience that sound sleep that's required in order to refresh our brain. We also recognize that there is that experience called brain fog or COVID fog, where as a result of coming down with COVID-19, Individuals had difficulty trying to pay attention afterwards, trying to think clearly. And as they reported, it just felt like they were basically working their way through a fog of thought, trying to come up with the right concepts. And unfortunately, there was an increase in depression, in anxiety. For some individuals, they experienced agoraphobia, which is the fear of going out. They simply were afraid to go out into the general public areas, even practicing public safety guidelines, because they were simply afraid of getting infected. We know that when the vaccines hit and people were encouraged to get vaccinated, there was an increase in what we're calling vaccination and needle phobia. Individuals who all of a sudden decided that the vaccine just simply didn't have enough research behind it for them. They, they developed intense fear of even considering getting a vaccine. And those individuals who would gladly welcome getting vaccinated, there was a small percentage of them that actually experienced what we call needle phobia, where they, they had intense fear associated with actually receiving the needle. They had beliefs that it might break off in their arm or the individual giving them the vaccination might uh, trip or move inadvertently and unfortunately harm them with the needle. We also know that screen time went through the roof, not only with children, but with adults. And I mean, let's, let's face it, that was the reality of our situation. Our meetings weren't with groups of people anymore. Our meetings were back-to-back -back team and Zoom meetings. So of course, screen time would go through the roof. But we're referring also to social media. And unfortunately, when social media screen time started to rocket, so did the fears, the phobias, the stresses, the anxieties associated with misinformation. We also found that individuals reflected more inward. And as a result, unfortunately, decided to really pinpoint their own personal faults. 
Some individuals associated, associated that with the stigma and as a way of attempting to cope, some individuals actually engaged in binge eating. Well, unfortunately, a lot of these issues, particularly the increase in screen time, the sleep disorders and the binge eating left us with this common phrase of the COVID-29, another scenario that was part and parcel of the overall COVID issue. COVID-29, what is it? It's on average, and this is the average, guys, the average weight gain of individuals throughout our overall entire pandemic. And, you know, nicely referred to as COVID-29. So how did it impact you? Well, let's consider two terms that are now part of psychological assessments. We have what's referred to as caution exhaustion and COVID stress syndrome. So if anybody's experienced that state of basically hypervigilance to public safety, you know, going in the grocery store and being aware as to who was wearing masks, who was following the arrows, who was going in the right direction, who was in a group. You know, people were constantly on high alert to make sure that everybody was following the protocols. Well, unfortunately, if that continued for any length of time, it resulted in what's referred to as caution exhaustion. And we also experienced the COVID stress syndrome where just simply people were in a state of mental distress. And it had no other validation other than our overall response to the overall pandemic. So, I mean, when you're immersed in a pandemic, what else are you going to do? You're going to accept it. You're going to try and deal with it. Or for some individuals, it will stress them out. So a lot of this research is basically common sense research, but it provides validity to how everybody was feeling. And a few more. Let's look at this one. Stress, absolutely, was still the big, big outcome of the pandemic, and still is to a certain extent. But the, the key factor in the felt experience of stress was the fact that a lot of employees working from home weren't able to draw that line in the sand as to what was home related and what was work related. And for a lot of employees, you know, we had to recognize we had new coworkers. Our coworkers weren't our peers. Our coworkers were family members, were children, perhaps older adults, even pets. These were our new peers. We had to get accustomed to working not only to their schedules, but getting them accustomed to working to ours. You know, how many Teams meetings, how many Zooms meetings have we all been part of where somebody's overly friendly cat kind of walked across the keyboard and disrupted the whole meeting? Well, you know, that was our new coworker. We just simply had to learn to get along with that. And what we also recognized is that Stress wasn't just related to the adult population. 43% of teens, they were reporting increases in how they were experiencing stress. And when they were asked, well, you know, what, what was it based on? It was because their schools were close. They were trying to learn from home, which they weren't accustomed to. They didn't have their peers, their friends to interact with. And for some of them, they just, they were just uncertain as to what the future looked like for them. Were they ever going to get back to normal? Well, what to do about it? You know, it's great that we're mentioning all these issues associated with the impact of the pandemic. We know a lot of it, you know, we've experienced, but how can we change it? What can we do about it? Well, the American Psychological Association, they published these really great recommendations. This is the order that they said that they followed in terms of importance. Mindfulness training. And you can download great apps that will help with that because what this is designed to do is basically calm our mind, calm our stress reaction system, help us get greater clarity on what it is we're looking at. Exercise, number two recommendation. The more exercise we can get, the healthier our bodies will be. And again, reduction in stress. Really important to connect with others. 
You know, we're, we're not designed to be alone. We are social creatures. We need the support of each other in order to function, in order to be healthy, and to learn, learn something new. Everybody took up a lot of new ho um, hobbies when we were locked down. I know, unfortunately, I was kind of part of that COVID-29 group because my husband decided he was going to learn how to bake bread. And he did on a daily basis. And I felt my job was to support him by eating as much of it as I possibly could. Well, I don't have to say anymore because you know how that all unfolds. <laughs> so let's see how well we're doing. And we need to make sure that we're getting our sleep. And by good sleep hygiene, it's meant by setting a time, a regular time every night for going to bed, making sure again, your bedroom's set up for sleep not for watching TV or social media, and to maintain and manage our diet. So other types of recommendations that we're kicking in, you know, they're again, common sense, but how often do we actually pay attention to these? Anybody ever tell you to give yourself some slack? Well, what about you telling yourself to give yourself some slack? You know, give yourself permission to seek help because we were locked down it gave permission to individuals to access telepsychology and a lot of people did they took advantage of it because they could do it from the absolute privacy of their own home they recognized that there was no stigma associated with it because they were able to keep it confidential i mean let's face it when somebody says that they're seeing a therapist or a psychologist or a counselor, oftentimes they feel that there's a stigma associated with it. But telepsychology from the privacy of one's home, it provided a lot of individuals with that confidentiality and protection from others that they needed in order to benefit from it. Well, we also know that children need to establish routines. That's how they function well. They need to know what time they get up, what time they go to bed, what time things happen, but they also need to be taught your routine so that they can understand when it's acceptable to interrupt and when it's not. And of course, that's based entirely on the age of the child. We're not definitely going to have a toddler learn our schedule, but we can certainly help a toddler understand when it's alone time or when it's time with the rest of the family. There's a few more recommendations. The latest research, which was just published a week ago, found that neighborhoods that have a lot of trees, individuals living in those neighborhoods have reduced depression rates as compared to individuals living in neighborhoods with less greenery. So immerse yourself in nature, get out and walk around. And this is a beautiful time of year and we're heading into a you know, an even more colorful season as the leaves start to turn. So get out and enjoy. Relieve the stressors. Just simply get immersed in nature. And how about this one? Keep things in perspective. Just one step at a time. I don't know about you, but, you know, a lot of times I try and take on the world. And Oftentimes, when I get that sense of recognizing that things are just a little too weighty, I have to take that step back and say, you know what, let's just do it one thing at a time. Just one thing first, and then the next, and then the next. And that really helps calm one's mind. And this is a biggie. Let's stop giving advice. Let's just give empathy and validation as to how each other's feeling. It goes a long way. Discuss the news. Conversations, discussions, really important, especially if you have teenagers, especially if you have young adults. Help them understand what the world news is all about. They oftentimes feel as though they're not part of the world. So discuss the news with them. Talk about racism. It was a biggie while we were locked down. Continue the conversation. Talk about gender diversity. Talk about diversity in general. Talk about culture, sex, gender identity. It's an opportunity to connect because to these young people, these topics are critical. They're very important for them. A few more, this is for the workplace specifically. Make sure that we're leading by example. Make sure that if you're managing employees, you're helping employees cope. 
by leading and letting them know what the good coping strategies are. Disconnect. When you're not at work, disconnect from work. Stay disconnected, especially emails, and expect that from your employees. It's great to say disconnect, but if you're going to bop off an email at 8 o'clock at night to your employee, then that's not disconnecting, and that gives the message it's okay to continue working past the hours. Reach out to employees. Reach out to each other. We have to. We have to recognize that we're not in it alone. And don't be afraid to ask, what do you need? A lot of times people are afraid to reach out and ask because they're afraid if they get asked for something, they won't know how or what to say. Oftentimes, all individuals want to know is that you're just simply there and that you're going to listen. They don't often want you to do anything. They just want to know that you're there for them. More recommendations? Well, take breaks. You know, the best analogy I could come up with for that was when we were locked down, we worked and we worked and we worked long hours and we were exhausted. But think of it from the perspective of going to the gym. Would you go to the gym and work out for three hours? Would you lift weights for three hours? Would you do, you know, an aerobics class or a yoga class for three hours? No, we wouldn't because our muscles would be too fatigued. We wouldn't be able to walk the next day. Don't expect our brain to function for that length of time without a break either because it also needs to be put at rest. Every 20 minutes, take a micro break. Allow your brain a little downtime. Allow it a little bit of refreshment, some fresh air, some cold water. It needs a break as well, just like our biceps, just like everything else does. And a few more recommendations. We have to recognize we have to recharge our batteries. Our batteries before our phone batteries. And that brings us back to that topic we discussed just two seconds ago about unplugging. If we unplug, from email, if we unplug, in particular from social media, anything electronic, if we unplug, we're telling ourselves we are important. And you know, I'm saying follow Huffington Post's example because Arianna Huffington learned this the hard way a few years ago when she fell, she tripped and fell on the rug in her office when she was entering in the morning and she hit her face on the corner of a massive, massive wooden desk. So surgeries later, almost a year of recovery later, she came back saying with, she knew why she had the accident. She said, I recall that night, the night before, going in and plugging her phone in because she said my phone battery needed to be recharged. She said, and I continued working well past the midnight hour. She said, the next morning I was exhausted. She said, and what message was I left with? We need to recharge our batteries first. So keep that in mind. You know, we, we need to recharge us first, not our phones, us. We have to give ourselves that level of priority. And, you know, just take time. Just take time, have a cup of tea, have a glass of water, just sit by the window or just simply get outside. We need to get outside. We need to practice self-care. Our clothes come, <clears throat> excuse me, with self-care labels. Look at our t-shirts, look, look at the example. We have tags on our clothes that tell us whether a piece of clothing can be washed in a washing machine, whether it needs dry cleaning, whether it needs hand washing. It depends on the delicacy and durability of the fabric. We are no different. We need self-care based on our state, our delicacy, our needs. We need to know when we need the care. We need to know how to provide that care because we have to recognize 
we have to give ourselves just very, very, very simple permissions to just simply be, be who we are, be where we are with everything that we have and just simply be. It's all about just simply nourishing ourselves to be at our best. So at work, how can you provide that self-care? Well, we have to develop awareness. Awareness to see what's needed and when it's needed. We have to flip the way we look at things. We can't, we can't look at situations with a bit of fear going into them. We have to turn problems around and see them as opportunities to see how we can take this and take that challenge and make it into something positive for us. And we have to make sure we have the resources within ourselves to provide because it boils down to just simply knowing we have to start respecting ourselves. We've been through a lot. You know, give ourselves a pat on the back for surviving. We have to have that self-respect. And please, we need hope. We need hope because it will enable us to visualize what we want, not what we fear. And one more, the most important thing, we need to talk. We need to talk to each other, to friends, to family, talk to our pets, talk to fish, just go outside and talk. We need to talk because if we're talking, it lets us know something so very, very important. One of the cornerstones of psychological health, it gives us the knowledge that we're not alone. And that is very, very critical.